Hello, welcome to Nursing with Professor B. My name is Bridget. I have a master's degree in nursing education. I'm also a family nurse practitioner. So in today's video, I will be going over ACLS cardiac arrest algorithm. My ACLS cheat sheet video, that is a tongue twister, has been seen uh, more than 17,000 times and I have helped hundreds of people pass their ACLS exam. So just another tool that I'm giving you. If you need to pass your ACLS exam and you're more of a visual and you like an algorithm versus a PowerPoint, then make sure you stay tuned. But first, make sure you hit the like button, make sure that you subscribe, make sure you turn on that notification bell. I'm gonna keep harassing you guys until I pay off my student loans. This is the adult cardiac arrest algorithm. Again, if you want a more in-depth cheat sheet, make sure you check out my ACLS cheat sheet video. I also made one on a, like a stroke cheat sheet as well, but this is for people that um, prefer the algorithm. Number one, you're going to start with CPR. You're going to give oxygen and you're going to attach the monitor or the defibrillator. Is this a shockable rhythm? If the answer is yes, and I'm just going to go down the yes pathway first, and then we'll go down the no, which rhythms are shockable. I also made a video on this little jingle or rap. All right, rhythms that are shockable are, ready for this? I'm not Cardi B and I'm not a rapper, but here we go. D-fib for V-fib and pulses V-tac. Don't D-fib asystole, you won't get them back. D-fib for V-fib and pulses V-tac. Don't defib asystole, you won't get them back. Okay. <laughs> so rhythms that are shockable is V-fib, ventricular fibrillation, or pulseless ventricular tachycardia. Those are shockable rhythms. Asystole, even if in real life you've seen asystole be shocked or pulseless electrical activity, for the purposes of the ACLS exam, those are not shockable rhythms. If they're in VFib or PVT or pulseless VTAC, um, shock. Symbol right there means a shock that you need to shock them, okay? Um, then, so that's three, you shock them. Number four, you start CPR for, you do CPR for two minutes and you establish IV or IO access, intravenous or intraosseous access. Is it a shockable rhythm? If it is, you shock again. That's five. Then six, CPR. Let's zoom in here. CPR for two minutes. Epinephrine every three to five minutes. Consider advanced airway cap and uh, capnography. If it is a shockable rhythm, you shock them again. That's seven. You do CPR for two minutes. Consider amiodarone and treat reversible causes. I will go over that in the next slide. The other thing I forgot to mention is if you're at eight, follow this little arrow, however you wanna go this way. But if you're at eight, you just keep going. If after eight, you keep going back here, basically to is this rhythm shockable and then proceed to step five. So from eight, shockable rhythm, and then keep going. Um, if the rhythm is not shockable because they're in asystole or PEA, which is pulseless electrical activity, you're going to do CPR for two minutes, uh, IV, IO access, epinephrine every three to five minutes, Consider advanced airway, uh, capnography. Is this a shockable rhythm? No. CPR, two minutes, treat reversible causes. Shockable rhythm? No. If no signs of ROSC, which is return of spontaneous circulation, then go to 11, back here. If ROSC, go to post-cardiac arrest care. If the rhythm is shockable, you go to five or seven, which is here, you shock them. This. These are additional notes in regards to the algorithm. You need to push hard and fast. That's what she said. <laughs> hard and fast, at least five centimeters in depth, 100 to 120 compressions per minute. You need to allow for full chest recoil. That song, um, ah, 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 staying alive, staying alive, ah, ah. You want to minimize interruptions in compressions. Avoid excessive ventilation, so you're not just, you want to rotate the compressor every five minutes or sooner if fatigued. If no advanced airway, you're doing 30 compressions to two breaths or two ventilations. You are using quantitative waveform capnography to monitor the effectiveness of CPR. Some people, I say PET CO2, I don't know if some people just spell out PET CO2, but if PETCO2 
is less than 10 attempt to improve CPR quality. So uh, with continuous waveform capnography, the PET CO2 stands for patient and tidal carbon dioxide, CO2 being the carbon dioxide. Normal values are 35 to 40. If it's less than 20, then your chest compressions are not being effective. And waveform capnography directly measures the elimination of carbon dioxide from the lungs. Also, intra-arterial pressure, if the relaxation phase, which is the diastolic phase, is less than 20, attempt to improve CPR quality. And then in regards to shock energy for defibrillation, with biphasic, you follow manufacturer recommendations. With monophasic defibrillation, the current only moves in one direction. Bi stands for two, and then biphasic defibrillation, the current moves in both directions. Uh, with biphasic, you follow manufacturer recommendation. Initial is 120 to 200 joules. Second and subsequent doses should be equivalent and higher doses may be considered. If you're doing monophasic defibrillation, then you use 360 joules. With ad So advanced airways will be endotracheal intubation or supraglottic advanced airway. And there's a typo because superglottic should have two t's so um apologies for that waveform capnography or capnometry to confirm and monitor tube placement again when i was doing my acls it was all about the waveform capnography that's what they kept talking about again this is a test question they do ask about the waveform capnography like which is the most effective way to measure um placement and they'll ask you if the pH is fine or a few other ones, and the right answer is waveform capnography. Once an advanced airway is in place, you give one breath every six seconds, or that's 10 breaths per minute, with continuous chest compressions. Return of spontaneous circulation or ROSC, if you notice that there's a pulse, if there's blood pressure, if there's an abrupt sustained increase in the PET CO2, typically greater than 40, if there's a spontaneous arterial pressure waves with intra-arterial monitoring. And then these, again, are the reversible causes, your H's and T's written out. Um, hypovolemia, hypoxia, hydrogen ion, which is acidosis, if there's hypo or hyperkalemia, hypothermia, tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, toxins, pulmonary thrombosis, or coronary thrombosis. So hope that helps. If you want a free copy of this um, algorithm, make sure that first you subscribe and you email nursingwithprofessorb at gmail.com. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.